Welcome back to Science Insanity. In the last episode, episode two of our clan trilogy, we covered the invasion of the inner sphere. All the lovely things that the clans got up to and how Clan Wolf decided that they were going to beat everyone else at their own game by simply being better in every way. And their genius plan worked. And this is episode three, the Battle of Tukiad, the third part of our clan trilogy and the final end of the clan invasion, the defining moment of the entire war, the greatest battle in all of Battletech history, and arguably one of the most hilarious examples of a single brain cell that all the clanners share. Joining me today is Steve, friendo who knows basically nothing about sci-fi, along for the ride to enjoy the insanity. Introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Steve. I am back again. This It's never going to change, is it? We're going to be like 500 episodes nope. in. Yeah, it's... <laughs> oh, yeah. Hello, I'm Steve. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right. No, you're getting... So, briefly, the quick synopsis. We're going to go over what happened in the last couple episodes, just as a little bit of a refresher, because even though you're meant to watch all three of these parts together, it's a series, you can watch them in bite-sized chunks. You don't got to watch them at all. Whatever you enjoy, check it out. And we're also going to be covering everything from the preparation phase, the politics, and all of the uh, material wealth and stuff that moved around to facilitate it. We're going to be talking about some of the major players, going over the actual battles that happened in moderate detail, because if we actually go into it, we're going to be here for like five years. And then we're going to talk about the aftermath afterwards, because oh my god, was there an enormous amount of destruction that happened. So, brief synopsis. The clans. The Battle of Tukiad happened basically at the end of the Clanner invasion. They decided that they were going to reform the Star League, they were the only people that deserved to rule all of humanity, and they basically blitzed their way across half of all human space to get towards Earth. They were assisted by Comstar, the seedy little ratchety bastards that everyone loves. They are basically the super space Illuminati, I'm pretty sure if you've watched the lore primer you would know that, but even if you're vaguely familiar with Battletech, that's a pretty good understanding of what Comstar does. This changed when the clans acknowledged that no, actually, we're not here to work with Comstar to rebuild the Star League, we're here to take over everything, Terra included, either bend the knee or get bent. That was the entire clan perspective, and Comstar decided, oh hell no, there is no way that we're letting you into my castle, the castle being Terra. They had basically backstabbed everyone in all of humanity to get a hold of it, and they're sure as hell not giving it up, especially because they become like religious fanatics about it over the centuries that they've been clandestinely in the back. And that is what led to the Battle of Tukiad, more like multiple miniature wars, because Comstar, in an effort to stop the clan invasion, issued a battle challenge to every single one of them. Comstar whipped it out, threw it out on the table, looked all of the other clanners in the eye and said, come on lads, unzip biggest schween tops, and then everyone else collectively shit their pants. <laughs> Comstar was coming out swinging, and they were determined to pull a win. As for the actual stakes of the conflict, because Comstar feared for Terras so greatly, they basically challenged all of the clans to a war, because they wanted to bring every single one of them to the same planet, and fight them and annihilate them in detail. Even if they lost, Comstar had absolutely no, you know, intentions of honoring their plan. I refuse to believe that they would honor a deal like that, because that's just not what Comstar is. But even if they lost... Well, yeah, honor duel for one side. Yeah, honor duel for one side. The other side is like, yeah, okay, idiots, whatever. I'll just nuke the planet afterwards if you're still on it. Like, who cares, right? But the actual stakes was that if Comstar lost then they would basically submit to the clans. All of the HPG network, the space telephone, the space internet, they would cut all of the other factions off from it and give exclusive help to the clans serving under them. If Comstar won, then all of the clans would have to kindly be paid $5 to fuck off. They would immediately halt their invasion for 15 years and would be forced to either go back to clan space or just chill out in the areas that they had conquered while allowing the rest of the inner sphere to rebuild. So, the stakes were very high for both sides, at least for the clanners, because, you know, Comstar probably would not at all care about going full nuclear hellfire if it meant slowing them down. The actual conflict wasn't an invasion of the planet. It was, since it's like an honor duel, right, a battle challenge, Comstar got to set the conditions for the engagement. 
Comstar picked 14 cities on the planet that would be used as targets of the invasion. Each clan would be assigned two cities. They had to hold the majority of the cities in order to win, right? So even if they held like eight cities, right, and some of the clans were annihilated, that would still count as a win. They had to hold the majority. Some would call that an absolute win. If the clans held a city but were forced out of it, then that would count as them losing the city. They had to maintain control after taking it, right? And all of this was designed so that Comstar could bleed the clans white. Not only were all of these cities picked almost exclusively for their terrain around them, ranging from like stupidly dense massive forests that made it basically impossible to march mechs through, to really narrow winding canyon networks that completely removed the clan's range advantage, to even like massive open fields and marshes that were hard to move through, but were flat enough that artillery and air assets could just pummel the invaders into dust. These cities were fortified to the absolute nines and positioned in such a way that assaulting them from almost any direction would have been a Herculean task. So Comstar was already stacking the advantages in their favor right from the word go. And because the clans are stupid and often can't muster a single brain cell between them, they just agreed to that. They weren't like, no, we're going to pick the cities or we're going to pick the area. They didn't care. They thought they were going to win regardless. And so they just ignored the uh, terrain advantage that they were handing over. Man, you, you know, they're too good. They, they needed to handicap themselves, you know? Oh, All done on purpose. <laughs> oh, don't don't worry. Some of the clans that invaded were pretty fucking handicapped. Don't worry. We'll, we'll get to that. All right. So when it came to the actual preparations for the battle, just as with the invasion to come, the clans, in their honor and stupidity-fueled ego-engorging ways, could not manage to come together and actually supply their goddamn invasion force. Because when they invaded the Inner Sphere, they thought it was going to be over so quickly that they didn't really bring any supplies or industrial manufacturing bases with them to keep the war going for a long time. And the Comstar General knew this, and so designed it to be as resource-intensive and as attritional as possible. And the clans not only didn't bring any supplies with them, basically ending their preparation phase immediately after it started, but they were also bringing in their most devastating weapons, quote unquote, which means the big autocannons and the missile launchers that run out of ammo terrifyingly fast if you have to use them for long durations. And even more on top of that, the order in which the clans were dropping also had to be decided. And the way that they went about doing this wasn't their stupid honor duels with each other where whoever wins a fight manages to be first in. They bid against one another in a reverse auction. Because you see, the clans believe in efficiency. So if two clans apply to invade a planet, basically, then whoever has the lowest bid is the one that gets the contract, just like with construction, because you don't want to spend more materials and resources than necessary. And normally, this would be an actually pretty good idea. What's the minimum amount of resources we need to get the maximum amount of reward, right? It's a pretty smart idea, but not really when you're fighting for the fate of humanity and, you know, I everything else. Seems to how th those contracts never seem to work out. Ever. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. Lowest bidder is usually not the greatest idea. So, this, this was mind-bogglingly stupid, right? When you're fighting for stakes this high. And the clans fucked it up, right? Firstly, though, we have to talk a little bit about Clan Wolf and their genius plan. So, I, I mentioned briefly at the beginning that their plan was to just be better than everyone else. And it, it kind of was. Unlike the other clans that from the beginning of the invasion had brought only what they thought they would need, Clan Wolf basically picked up everything and brought it to the Inner Sphere. They held nothing back. They picked up their entire industry, their entire economy, all of their supplies, the vast majority of their military, and moved it all to the Inner Sphere. And that was part of the reason why they bulldozed through everyone, right? They also learned from the Inner Sphere because occasionally they would find mercenaries or counterattacks or stalwart defenses that could blunt or halt or even reverse the momentum of Clan Wolf. And each time, they didn't just attribute it to being unlucky or incompetent warriors or whatever, right? 
they actively learned from the Inner Sphere because they acknowledge that while the clans were vastly superior, the Inner Sphere could still learn, they could still win, and if given the chance, they would adapt and they would win. So Clan Wolf never gave them that chance. They always studied and respected what their enemy was doing. So you're saying the one brain cell of the clans was just with Wolf the entire time? Yeah, pretty much. They, they monopolized the single brain cell that the clans had, which is why they ended up, you know, being the only clan that actually you know, fucking steamrolled everything. But the other part of their plan was that by being so much better than the rest of the clans, it basically drove them into an honor and shame-fueled rage, and it was biting the other clanners in the ass because they were all desperate, absolutely frothing at the mouth to show up Clan Wolf and prove that they weren't just the hangers-on that they absolutely were to the Clan Wolf invasion of the Inner Sphere, right? Um, so when it came to the clans that were actually going to participate, Clan Wolf's genius mind games worked again. The shame and the humiliation of not only failing to accomplish their goals, but to be utterly outperformed by a hated rival, you know, the wolves, drove Clan Smoke Jaguar to the biggest mistake of their lives. In order to guarantee that they would be first onto the planet, they basically threw all of their money at the guy doing the auction, or in this case, threw all of their dudes out an airlock. Smoke Jaguar didn't bid away a few of their units here and there. They didn't sacrifice some air power or some support or some logistical stuff, no. They bid away an entire third of their total sum military power. A third of their army they just <laughs> left behind in order to be first on the planet. God. It's, it's mind-boggling how stupid some of these clanners are, man. Second into the fray was Clan Novacat, having bartered away a few divisions of, of mechs. Not too much. Next up was Ghost Bear, who again didn't sacrifice too much. In fourth was Steel Viper. Fifth on the chopping block were Clan Diamond Shark, the only other clan besides Wolf that has a halfway decent name. Yes, I'm going to die on this hill. Clan names are stupid. Seethe and Cope, Clanner fans. Your favorite factions are named like DeviantArt Fursonas, and nothing you do will unruin those names for you. Have fun with the intrusive thoughts. Clan Jade Falcon were, uh, were sixth to drop, mostly because they got their ass beat by the Inner Sphere earlier and couldn't afford to bargain away any more of their troops. In the uh, Clan Invasion episode, I believe they were the ones that lost, like, the entirety of their elite troops to a massive Inner Sphere counterattack. So they were getting their ass clapped already by the Inner Sphere, and they couldn't afford to get rid of anything. And last, as well as most definitely not least, Clan Wolf. Clan Wolf was essentially forced to be last due to the other clans basically insulting them. They gave them the unimportant targets, they gave them the last ones to be dropped, it was, it was an insult. But one that Clan Wolf was very happy to accept, even offering advice to the other clans because, again, they had studied their opponents. They knew what they were going to try to do, and they understood how their enemy was going to try to fight them. But the other clans absolutely- hey, you offering no advice in here. You, you should know that. Yeah, no, that's literally what happened. They basically got told to shut the fuck up and leave, Grandpa, and all the other clans just immediately went about doing their own thing, completely ignoring the advice Clan Wolf was giving them. Which is hilarious, this because- This isn't a group project, man. This is this is a solo per project. You I, gotta do it on your own. Well, it, it's literally a, the definition of a group project, though. You fail or win together. Even if, like, one clan demolishes Comstar, it doesn't matter. They still lose. They're, they're honor-bound and not allowed by the- the challenges rules to attack other cities. Like, if you capture your two cities, that's it, it's done. You need at least, like, three or four other clans to win both of their cities as well in order to win this contest, right? And they're just, they're just not. They're just not working together, which is, it's so dumb. Just work as a team, you colossal idiots. No, I refuse. God. I'd rather die. <laughs> I would, I would rather die than win. <laughs> <laughs> you can do both, Clanners. You can do both. Uh, as for Comguard, Comstar's military, they had the man, the myth, the legend himself, Frederick Steiner, also known currently, while with Comstar, as Preceptor Anastasius Foch. You see, the clans took one look at this guy. Decided he was a paper general for the honor guard of a Comstar, a, a telecommunication company, and dismissed him out of hand. 
he would make them choke on those beliefs. Frederick Steiner, henceforth named Freddy, because, like, I can't be fucked to pronounce Anastasius like a million times. While in... While, Freddy, man. Yeah, Freddy, right? We'll just call him Freddy. While he was a general in the Lyrian Commonwealth, he was anything but one of the social and rich incompetents that bloated their command structure and got there by promotion, right? Like, just paying their way up. This guy went through years of military schooling. He was a veteran of dozens of conflicts and had even fought in the Succession Wars, the fourth one. This guy was an absolute hardcore general, a true fighting man. He was a born and raised leader. However, after a failed coup attempt against the then Steiner Archon, he repented, and as, you know, penance, he led a suicidal assault against Draconis Combine's supply depots and infrastructure. He managed to cripple the Combine's forces and prevent an invasion during the Fourth Succession War at the cost of essentially his entire unit being wiped out and himself being presumed dead. He was, of course, taken prisoner by um, the Draconis Combine and later hoovered up by Comstar because they love to use their clandestine power to get a hold of any and all talent that they can find out there in the stars. If it's literally like, ooh, piece of candy, ooh, piece of candy, is they're just hoovering up people all across the inner sphere. So, when the clans invaded, Comstar's higher-ups didn't plan or prepare to fight the clans, like, at all. They viewed them as another Star League holdout, and one that they could work with to restore the Star League. Freddy, however, spent every waking moment poring over tactics, technology, communications, and anything he could get a hold of. He ran training exercises against simulated clan forces using Comstar's data and relics of the Star League's advanced technology. So when the time came to fight, he was more than ready to take up the challenge. Freddy would... Okay. Freddy would turn Tukiad into the graveyard of the clans. Many of them that landed would not be leaving. The strategy laid they, out... They were just dying to get in there? Oh, they were just dying to get into a fight with Freddy, yeah. That's, that's a wonderful dad joke, by the way. I will not give you a laugh because it doesn't deserve it, but perhaps everyone in the comments that will watch this can give a very awkward ha-ha and like a shrug in there. Just, you know, support the terrible jokes. Um... Like I was saying, though, the, the strategy laid out by Freddy was simple. The clans used extremely high damage weapons and long-range lasers, but didn't really bring much ammunition, resupply, and repair resources to sustain a long-duration fight. So Freddy would drag the clans out across the planet, separating them, slowing them down, harassing them, and picking at them until they either ran up against impenetrable fortifications or fell to one of the myriad ambushes that he would set up all over the planet. And when the fighting started, it rapidly became clear that it wouldn't be a fight. It was a slaughter. When Smoke Jag Jaguar first landed, they annihilated all the resistance within and around their landing zone, splitting their forces to assault both their target cities at once. However, this was only a feint. Jade, Fal Jade Falcon, what? I wrote this wrong in my notes. Smoke Jaguar, no. <laughs> Smoke Jaguar was lured into a long, narrow canyon, and while the clan leader noted that this was most likely a trap and used, you know, probing forces and advanced scouts to figure out, yeah, this was a very obvious trap, they decided, in the most aggressively clanner, dented forehead way possible, to simply trigger the trap by running directly into it as Comstar expected them to. And what they did was they raced along the narrow confines of a long canyon at the edges, hoping to avoid most of the fire that would inevitably come from the clifftops. And while they did manage to avoid most of the incoming fire, using the very steep cliffs to kind of mitigate the angles that the comm guard could take to punish them, they still took a brutal mauling from the units arrayed on both sides of the canyon before eventually outrunning them and racing into the open beyond. However, once again, this was intended. Even though, you know, Freddy knew there's no way to annihilate the clans in an ambush like that, he still set it up because immediately after this narrow canyon, along the fastest route or the most direct route, I should say, to their targets, Clan Smoke Jaguar would have to pass through a disgusting, fetid bog, a massive area of marshland with deep running still water and just 
horrible sucking mud everywhere that made any form of mech or vehicle movement absolutely impossible. So they minimized their losses, but took a rather brutal mauling. Once they were in the marshland, as it turns out, Freddy had spent his preparation time pre-zoning hundreds of artillery fire zones and airstrike coordinates. So once the clanners were into the marshland, they were slowed down and were forced into more open and exposed formations because of the unwelcoming terrain, all the while air assets and artillery began absolutely hammering around them. And keep in mind, this is really wet soil and terrain, right? An artillery shell landing in there is going to completely destroy any ground that you might have been able to walk over. You know, that you wouldn't sink into as well, but it is what it is, right? Y yeah. Yeah. And in order to continue harassing the clans, Comstar pulled all of its heavy units away from the marshlands, and instead employed hovercraft. You know those hoverlanders and stuff that the U.S. has, like the big you know, air skirts and stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah, basically those, heavily armored and running with lasers and missiles and stuff. They would swoop over the terrain, completely unaffected by the marshland, and just pepper Clan Smoke Jaguar with fire. It didn't do much because these are relatively light units and they couldn't engage, otherwise they wouldn't, you know, they would be destroyed outright by the clans, but... This right. constant harassment would constantly keep the clans from reforming and advancing because they had to address these threats, and it pissed them off to no end. Imagine a hundred mosquitoes floating around your ear in the middle of the night when you're trying to go to bed. That level of aneurysm-inducing rage. By the time the jaguars actually reached their target cities, it was clear that they had failed. Both their commanding cons had been killed, nearly a third of their landed forces were disabled or destroyed before even reaching the fortress city, and even worse, they realized they had moved into a killing field of their own making. In front of them was the fortress city they were meant to assault, heavily fortified with all of the heavier units that uh, Freddy didn't put out to stop the clan's advance through the marshes, and they were all entirely intact. As well, other reinforcing units from different theaters that had yet to come under clan attack were coming in from their flanks, all the while the artillery was still going, and when they tried to retreat, they had found that the ambushers from earlier had abandoned their elevated positions and were now blocking their path. They were literally penned in from every side while being pounded relentlessly from every potential asset and system that Freddy could bring to bear. By the time the fighting... Sorry? If I'm being honest, sounds like they got a pretty good chance of winning that, though. I mean, they're oh. surrounded on all sides. I mean, they can't possibly miss anything, so... Oh, yeah. Sh surely they'll win. Definitely. Being shot at by ten guys from ten different directions is absolutely a strategic advantage. You you can't miss. Yeah, I mean, What's the problem? And, exactly. uh, you know, I guess the problem was, you know, they, they tried to retreat. The, the operative word being tried. Tried. By the time the fighting was over... Clan Jaguar had less than a quarter of its total strength remaining, and the vast majority of that was the divisions of battle mechs and soldiers that they had bargained away and not brought to Tukiad. They had lost almost everything that set foot onto this world and had nothing to show for it. Comstar, of course, suffered far worse casualties, but Comstar wasn't bringing one or two clans worth of, you know, units onto the field. Comstar was bringing everything. Dozens of entire army-sized units all over the planet. All of them fresh and all of them supplied for months worth of hard fighting, even though any given conflict was only likely to last a couple days. They were absolutely... So you're saying they had logistics... They did, they did, in fact, have logistics, and they also <laughs> had a massive manpower advantage. So the clans could kill four or five soldiers for every one they lost, but it just didn't matter. They could not replace their losses, Comstar absolutely could, and would at the drop of a hat. So they may have died in greater numbers, but proportionally, Comstar had butchered the first clan onto the planet. When Clan Novacat tried to land on the second day, Comstar said no, you're not allowed to. We, we should probably explain something. Comstar were relatively green. They don't really do any fighting, and this is realistically the first time that Comstar has actually moved in such an open way. 
nobody really understood that Comstar had, like, massive armies worth of Star League era technology and stuff that they that they were capable of bringing to bear. So most of their units were green, and they had never seen real combat. However, it didn't really matter, because Comstar and the Com Guard were beyond fanatical. They were incredibly well-trained, remarkably well-drilled, and they were absolutely willing to die, you know, if it was to bring a little bit of damage against the clans. The, the easiest analogy is that Comstar was more than willing to shatter their hand in order to break the jaw of the clans, right? So Did they uh, implement the not one step back as well, or? No, there was many tactical retreats, but there, there was okay. there was many cases where the Com Guard was ordered to hold, and they literally fought and died to the last man before retreating or breaking or anything, right? Like they they're they're beyond fanatical in this kind of battle because they were people who were fighting as if the entire future of humanity rested on their shoulders. Like they they fought because they really understood what was at stake here. And they were also, you know, religiously kind of crazy, but it helps, it helps. That's the unimportant part. That's I mean. the unimportant part, right? Um, so when Nova Cat was trying to land, they have this advanced maneuver where instead of actually landing their dropships, they use jump jet capable mechs and stuff to jump out of their dropships and their big transports in, you know, super high atmosphere or like low orbit to minimize the time that they're spent in vulnerability unloading, right? Unfortunately, Comstar went abso fucking lootly not. They had studied all of those tactics before, and when Clan Novacat tried, Comstar scrambled everything that they had into the air and into space. Every single fighter and, you know, strike craft and platform they had to deliver munitions was thrown into the air to combat this. You know, Comstar fighters and strike craft would shoot down literally any clan vessels they could come across. They would dump all of their missiles into the engines and the propulsion vectoring controls of the clan transports and then allow them to plummet to the planet below and just obliterate themselves on impact. Good old physics doing the work for them. When the missiles ran empty- Good old terminal velocity. Terminal velocity fallen from orbit, right? When they ran low on missiles, they would use lasers and autocannons to pepper the weaker parts of the ships, trying to disable their controls or trying to snipe out the cockpits so that they would just tumble off into the planet as well. And when they ran dry, when the ships were critically damaged, when they had nothing left to give, the pilots would physically ram their ships into the enemy's engines or try to ram into the bridges in order to just absolutely cripple anything they could. The clans were absolutely caught off guard by how fanatic and how furious the Com Guard's, you know, air assets were in this fight. And in fact, one of their biggest transports, carrying something like 40 mechs along with like 200 power armored elementals, right? Someone, one of the Comstar pilots, Just a few of them, uh, a Comstar pilot rammed into the bridge of this dropship and destroyed it, crippling it. The entire thing fell out of low orbit, and not a single clanner escaped that ship. It was also bringing a massive amount of ammunition and spare parts onto the planet as well, and without those, all the damage that the forces that did make it to the planet sustained trying to land couldn't be repaired. Novacat, Damn, the yeah, only logistic ship. The only, <laughs> the only one. They had more, but that one had like the most amount of crap in it, right? Um, so Clan Novacat was essentially cut off at the knees before they could even get to the planet. And if that single strike wasn't enough, the desperation that Clan Novacat had was the breaking point for them. You see, they didn't have the resources to manage their invasion anymore. So instead of pushing directly towards the cities, Novacat fanned out after landing and reorganizing what, you know, survivable troops they had, and they began fanning out and pushing towards suspected Comstar ammunition depots and supply points, right? They were trying to take all whatever- All seven troops. What? <laughs> all seven troops that they had yeah, that all, survived? Yeah, all seven guys that survived. Because they were so desperate, once they got to these supply depots and pushed Comguard's forces out of it, 
They immediately began stripping their mechs and trying to repair their armor, reload their weapons, uncrate whatever they could find and use to resupply their forces, but it wasn't enough. Expecting that this would happen, because the plan from the very beginning by Freddy was not to annihilate them, but to cripple them when they were trying to land, even so far as ordering them to focus more on transports and supply ships, rather than the mech dropships and, uh, you know, like landing vehicles and stuff. And once they were tied down trying to rearm, Freddy mobilized multiple ComGuard armies to surround those supply depots and annihilate the Novacats. They caught them essentially with their pants down, completely unawares, and obliterated what few forces they had left on the planet, either forcing them to retreat or simply encircling and destroying them outright. So the second clan that had attempted to assault Tukiad was left broken across the countryside, scattered from high orbit, or caught and killed in pre-designed kill boxes. All that clan of technology and superior genetics clearly not helping them now against a person who actually understands what it takes to win wars. When I say that they were just hemmed in and destroyed, I mean that they were annihilated. Clan Novacat functionally ceased to exist. They were only able to salvage 15 operational mechs, three stars worth, out of the hundreds that they brought and the hundreds if not thousands more elementals and support units that they were going to bring along with them. Almost the entirety of their forces were just gone. When Clan Steel Viper invaded on the third third try, you know, third try is the charm, they learned from the mistakes of, of their yeah, of course. They learned from the mistakes of their predecessors to a degree landing much farther away from uh, established air superiority and, you know, artillery zones of ComGuard, and they spent a lot more time ensuring that they could take air superiority and that they had control of all the areas around their landing zone before pushing out. They also made sure that they could unpack and create all of their forward supply depots ahead of time before they moved out, so that it would be much easier and safer to bring mechs back for repair, to rearm them, and basically to reorganize fresh assaults or new movements. So all in all, they were actually doing much better. They even gave ComGuard, or sorry, they even gave ComStars ComGuard, those names are so fucking awful to say, but they even gave ComStar quite a bloody nose, annihilating a lot of scouting elements, destroying forward operation bases, and even circling, uh, encircling and annihilating several advanced forces that constituted a pretty significant amount of mechs. The ComGuard were suffering rather nasty losses against Steel Viper early on, and it was going quite well for the clans. Unfortunately, this played into Freddy's plan as well. Because Steel Viper had landed so far away, it was giving ComStar plenty of time to create long, drawn-out battle lines and, you know, conflicts of attrition that they would absolutely win. Steel Viper basically being forced to enter a region known as the Hell's Baths because Comstar kept retreating and kept baiting them into more small engagements to drain their munitions and whittle down their forces. If they wanted to get anything done, they would have to move through this region or spend an inordinate amount of time going around it. Now, the reason it's called Hell's Bath is because it is an intense region of geothermal and volcanic activity where massive rivers and lakes of boiling mud and sulfurous water lined narrow canyon cliffs and paths and elevated rock structures that were the only way to cross this area. If a mech fell clearly in- Clearly this will have no effect on the mechs Oh or yeah, clearly this will have no effect. If a mech were to fall into one of these pits, they were hundreds of meters deep before you hit, you know, like tectonically stable ground. So if a mech were to fall off these narrow precipices, right, they're gone. They're just sinking into the mud and they're not coming back, right? You're not getting gone them back. forever. Gone forever, reduced to atoms. And after entering Hell's Bath, Comstar moved multiple entire armies worth of resources into position in front of and in flanking positions around the clanners. Some mechs fell into this horrible mire because the ground simply gave out beneath them. It was that unstable. 
others were targeted by airstrikes and artillery, and the elevated platforms they were walking on collapsed into the mud, and entire units simply disappeared. They would lose contact after frantic radio communications and could just never be found by clan command afterwards. This was truly a hellish environment to fight in. And because they were being shepherded through such narrow confines, it completely destroyed the range advantage that their weapons had and the brawls that would break out between them and the fanatical Comguard forces within Hell's Bath were on a much more even playing field. And because Comstar- Good old fashioned guerrilla warfare tactics. Oh, of course. Although in this case, it's less of guerrilla tactics and more, well, no, I guess, you know, angry silverback throwing things around is still technically guerrilla warfare, but. <laughs> <laughs> in, in this case, the calm guard were so fanatical. In many cases, they would walk around a corner and the clans would be face to face with uh, Comstar forces and Comstar would be more than willing to rush the clanners down and simply force them off the paths into the mud. Even if they had to go down themselves, it was absolutely a win to trade a, a, an inner sphere mech for a clan mech, right? That kind of one-to-one -one trade yeah. is absolutely in I mean, Freddy's that's favor. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's that's an amazing trade. Why wouldn't you do that? Um, yeah. So it was it was brutal. Aside from constant ambushes and raw slugging melee fights between the mechs. In fact, I actually, I think I might have a picture of this actually, of a mech holding a big knife and standing on top of a, standing on top of a rock outcropping. I might have that. Da, 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 da. Oh, I, I, I do. Oh my God, I do. Okay, here we, here we go. Have fun with this. This is a wonderful example of the kind of shit that uh, the clans had to fight through. This, this is a wonderful example of Hell's Bath, the kind of conditions they had to deal with, right? You see that mech standing up there with the, the, the PPC, the particle projector cannon? He's got a giant yeah. fuck-off sword in the other hand. This man is absolutely willing to jump down and kill himself to stab the mech below him. Like, this is the kind of stuff the clans had to fight through the entire time. There was never a break that they had. Where were I? I lost is my that position. A smaller mech climbing up that mech on the... Yeah, that's, that's an elemental. That's the... Um, Okay. That's okay. that's the clanner's like power armor, right? It's it's gotcha. it's like ten feet, eleven feet or something like that tall. It's not it's not quite as big as like a light mech, but it's it's pretty chunky, and the clans brought hundreds of those guys. They they did not have fun. And uh to the Viper's credit, they actually tried to retreat. The con even going so far as to ignore, you know, angry complaints from their uh underlings you know, that this was dishonorable and stuff because they were more concerned about preserving their forces. You know, they got to hold the single brain cell that day. Unfortunately, what I can only describe as the chadliest move to ever be performed by anyone else besides Kerensky and Almighty Frederick was this dude <laughs> in an atlas. You see, Kerensky's gigadick energy possessed this man while Frederick Steiner's military brilliance showed him the chosen way. Commanding the Comguard forces in the, the Hell's Bath Theater was Precentor Belshore. From the cockpit of his atlas, he used his communication uplink to send an unencrypted public message to all of the clan Viper mech warriors. He said, and I quote, Hey, Steel Vipers, y'all a bunch of bitches. Come fight me and stop running, you cowards. I don't want to shoot you in the back. As he spoke, <laughs> as he spoke, he was raising both middle fingers on his atlas and thrusting vigorously at the clanners. This man was doing everything in his power to piss them off and play on all of their cultural weaknesses. He laid down an open challenge to all of Clan Steel Viper, personally saying that they should bust their ass over to him and fight a duel because he'll beat them all to death himself if they do, calling them weaklings and cowards and all of that, that they would turn tail and run at such little resistance. The Vipers were absolutely butchered when they turned back into the trap to heed this challenge, because while they may have decided to go fight this duel, the guy in the atlas had absolutely no problems shelling them into oblivion within the volcanic hellscape. Uh, it's so, it's so God, good. That's, this, that's great. This battle is so good. There's so many little moments like that where you're like, how the fuck? 
This dude in the Atlas basically just salvaged that entire fight for Comstar, denied the Vipers a chance to retreat and regroup by just calling them out for being stupid. It's like, it's so good. It's so good. Uh, so the Vipers were absolutely annihilated. And on and on it went. Every clan that landed was handedly destroyed, either due to their own anger and arrogance blinding them, choking on their own showmanship and self-assured victory, or heeding the call of honor over tactics and strategy. The clans were systematically taken apart. Now that's not to say that they didn't win battles, they did. Some of the clans even managed to capture one of their cities and hold it, while I think Ghost Bear managed to temporarily take both of their cities before being beaten. Yeah, but they were beaten back out of both of them by incredibly determined Comguard counterattack. The other thing oh, to mention... Maybe if they had a better name, they, they wouldn't have gotten beaten back, but... Yeah, maybe if they weren't so goddamn pretentious. Clan Ghost Bear, yes. Maybe if they weren't so goddamn stupid. Um, the, the big thing, though, is Comstar had even set the cities up to be traps. They had designed them and fortified them in such a way that it would be incredibly difficult to assault them from the outside, but once inside, should the defenders wish, most of the defenses would be rendered pointless. Most of the positions that the Inner Sphere occupied couldn't be used by the clans. Many of them were designed to be retaken easily from a different direction, so the clans would assault from the obvious path to take. And, you know, the uh, the Inner Sphere and Comguard would attack from a much slower and much more difficult terrain-wise example. But once they got to the city, none of the defenses there would, you know, be positioned to stop them. So it was very difficult for the clans to actually hold on to any territory that they managed to take um uh, certainly that uh home field advantage that that comstar set up oh i wouldn't have any effect absolutely like <laughs> comstar made incredible use of every advantage that they possibly could have like literally anything even so little as um, having individual people laid out around the planet. Like, they evacuated all the civilians ahead of time, that was part of the rules, but instead of having large units that would be out scouting, right, they would essentially put suicidal people by themselves in a jeep with a radio out in the middle of buttfuck nowhere, and their some job would be to <laughs> scream, oh dear god, there, and then they die, and Comstar knows, oh hey, he was over there, that's where the clans are, right? Even and going... And GPS tracker in there, just to make sure you know it's Yeah, working. just just to make sure, right? Um, they went as far as to do all of that, like, suicidal tactics were absolutely not an issue as well, and in many cases, I mentioned last stands. A lot of those weren't defensive. They were offensive. What caught the clanners most off guard is that Comstar was not afraid to go on the offensive immediately at the drop of a hat. If it looked like one of the clans were going to try to reposition or exploit, um, you know, a, a breakdown in the lines somewhere further else, if they looked like they were trying to send units to go reinforce another division in a different front, Comstar had absolutely no problems of throwing an entire army's worth of units at the clans to pin them down and hold them there while other more well-stocked or heavier-hitting units would come in to reinforce and surround them. Many of the units that fought and died to the last man were holding actions offensively to pin the clans down somewhere and basically just keep them there so that the heavier hitters could annihilate them. And they would die, like, to the last man, literally. The last poor fucking infantry on the ground with his rifle charging a battle mech with bayonet drawn level of last man standing. And, of course, when it came time for Clan Wolf, they were the only clan that succeeded. Not simply a little, not after, not after being crippled, they truly won the day. They destroyed Comstar's forces on all of the areas they were given to attack. They accomplished the capture of both cities and the annihilation of all resistance for three reasons. Firstly, they respected and studied their Intersphere counterparts. 
inner sphere, not inter. That flubbing my words. We've been going for like fifty minutes. Forgive, 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 and forget. You, you know the thing. The the thing, the thing, right? Um, they respected all that the inner sphere did. Every effective counterattack, every surprise ambush, every dogged defense and aggressive attack was studied as to why and how the inner sphere could resist and defeat Clan Wolf. They never did, but they got close several times, and Clan Wolf learned from it every time. Two, they didn't abide by the stupid honor rulings of the rest of the clan. Just like being forced to be one of the Vanguard clans, Clan Wolf did not hold back or underbid to get in first. They were forced to go last, and they were going to make absolute use of it. Clan Wolf didn't bring everything, but compared to the other clans, they may as goddamn well have because they brought more than double the next heaviest drop from the other clans. More than double, something like two and a half, three times more units onto the world, and they were geared to go for the long haul. And the third reason, leading into that, is that they weren't stupid. They understood that Frederick would try to stall for time in hopes that the clans would run out of ammo, it had worked multiple times so far, and Clan Wolf was more than willing to learn from the failures of the other fellow clans rather than their own. At the start of the battle, or before it I should say, during the prep phase, Clan Wolf deployed much farther from the target, spread extremely wide across the terrain to counter Comstar's defensive advantage and strength in numbers, right? By attacking from multiple prongs. They even refit their entire force with almost exclusively energy weapons, heat sinks, and more armor for a long, drawn out campaign in the expectation that they're going to be engaged often, engaged for a long duration, and they won't be allowed to break encounter with the enemy at their own leisure. So they set themselves up for the long haul, both in a fight and for the overall campaign. Wow. Thanks, Alienware. 13 updates are ready to install. Oh boy. <laughs> the, fucking, the fucking pong in the background. That's gonna have to stay in because I can't be bothered to edit that out in the middle of a sentence. Where was I? That that threw me off real bad now. I gotta look at my jot notes. It's oh yeah, be like yeah, whenever yeah. I Discord message you during a stream. Yeah, oh my god. It's, <laughs> Who the fuck did that? <laughs> Who the hell is this? What the hell was that? They also brought an utterly fucking insane amount of spare parts and ammo for the ammo consuming weapons that they did bring. Enough to last for multiple months in a conflict that was scheduled for only a few days. They pulled out all the stops, and just like moving their entire industry to the inner sphere to support the invasion, they were loaded for bear and they were ready to go, right? When the fighting started, Clan Wolf uh, met many of the same traps and pre-designated killing fields as the other clans, but their greater numbers and unwillingness to simply charge in meant that when they did run into these fortified ambushes and, you know, killing fields, they were perfectly happy to just sit there and trade shots at long range behind cover while other units further afield, because of, you know, their incredible numbers advantage and the really wide battle lines, could outflank and surround the comm guard. In many cases, they utterly obliterated Comstar forces by surrounding them when suddenly the clan forces that they were meant to be pinning down would surge forward in another attack. You know, they'd be pinned between a hammer and an anvil. Or in the clan case, you know, two shotguns, one pressed at your chest, the other at your back. And despite finding and fighting heroic defenses and grueling final stands against the clan wolf onslaught, the clan did push to the first city, capturing it after annihilating most of Comstar's forces and suffering enormous damage and heavy losses in exchange. However, instead of simply moving on, they positioned a huge bulk of their forces in the city and around the city and used them to fortify it against an assault to retake it, while at the same time rebuilding many of the defenses and chasing down the Comstar forces that escaped ensuring that there wasn't anything behind them or on their flanks that could potentially be used to move around them and basically outmaneuver their assault. So when the wolves... That one brain cell really coming in handy. Again. Yeah, they're, they're countering Freddy almost move for move because Frederick actually tried to reconstitute many of the retreating forces to attack the clans in the rear from multiple directions. 
but since the clans pursued them, they basically destroyed Comguard in detail before moving on to the next set of fortified armies around the second city. When the wolves did get to the second city, they immediately engaged across the front of Comstar's defenses. While seemingly foolish, since they were stretched extremely wide and reinforcements from the other battlefields were on their way, this turned out to be a brilliant move and ploy by Clan Wolf, as they moved several detachments, uh, the most notable one called the Hell Spiders, behind enemy lines in the confusion of the widespread assault. None of the units were, you know, free, none of them could really pay attention to what was going on, because all of them were being engaged at the same time. And when the reinforcements came and the Calm Star, uh, the Calm Guard's lines flexed to allow for reinforcements and the reorganization of their lines, the clan trap was sprung. The units that they had snuck behind Calm Guard, or uh, Calm Star, sorry, uh, encircled the reinforcing uh, armies, annihilating multiple of them and causing absolute chaos as several of the units at the front that were trying to rotate out for fresh reinforcements were caught just randomly in the middle of this chaotic melee. And it was a chaotic melee. Clan units would randomly be encircled, only to then have those Comstar forces encircled by even more clan forces. There was th uh, assaults, counter-assaults, movements all over the place. It was absolute chaos during this mad scramble. That sounds like a normal day, man. I, I don't know that I would describe that as chaos. Um, in that kind of situation, though, the clan's superior reaction time, better mechs, and more powerful weapons carried the day rather handedly. So unfortunately, for Comstar at least, Clan Wolf smashed the defensive line and took their second city, winning their challenge, immediately beginning to fortify it because there were still a few days left and they didn't trust that uh, Freddy would just give up. Of course, being the end of the conflict and realizing that they had lost the second city, Frederick conceded defeat and pulled all of his forces and all of his resources away from those two cities to preserve as much of the Calm Guard as he could in case, in some way, the clans wouldn't follow through with the deal and the fighting would need to restart. And that is functionally the end of the Battle of Tukiad. It was the most stunning victory anyone had ever won against the clans and had successfully shattered multiple of them, basically annihilating their ability to continue fighting any conflicts, much less the invasion. And that brings us to the aftermath of it. So the aftermath of the actual conflict, it was catastrophic, apocalyptic almost. While Comstar was badly mauled, the clans had suffered nearly 40% military losses in a mere 20 days. Most of them that came to Tukied would never leave it. The inner sphere was basically given a miracle. Tukied was a miracle. It allowed them time to rebuild. 15 years, in fact, because, well, the clans did actually stick to the rules of the engagement. And while also smashing much of the clan's military power and allowing the Inner Sphere's colossal industry to catch up and overcome the clan's skill and power with sheer weight of numbers, right? The Inner Sphere was given a reprieve to rebuild and fortify, and another clan invasion would most likely be impossible. They could still make massive gains and create incredible destruction, but would they be able to overcome the Inner Sphere again? Most likely not, never again considering the massive disparity in military equipment. As for the clans, it was the effective death of their collective culture. For many that thought the invasion was a bad idea, the Warden clans, this essentially revived their political movement and eventually led to a schism in the clans. The Crusaders returned to their home worlds to rebuild and cull the weak in what would become known as the Wars of Reaving, preparing for a second invasion while the Warden clans, many of them at least, chose to stay in the Inner Sphere and becomes Wardens of the Space, deciding to protect the Inner Sphere from the Crusaders, or in some cases even attempting to shepherd the Inner Sphere towards peace and reconstitution of the Star League. And it was a remarkable change. The Battle of Tukiad capped off essentially 
the reclamation of all humanity's technology. With the invasion of the clans and all of the stuff they brought with it and the unlocking of many data vaults by the Federated Commonwealth and the United Inner Sphere, they basically had access, slow as it may be trickling back out, they had access to almost everything that they had lost over the last like 400-500 years of constant warfare. So humanity was on its path to rebuild itself to the pinnacle it once was, while the clans were firmly shattered. Ironically enough, the Inner Sphere also got real, real fucking hangry at the clans. Imagine that, huh? That they would be a little miffed at the, the invasion. Uh, they got real angry and launched a massive war of retribution into clan space after uncovering the way there. Clan Smoke Jaguar tried to lie and play down its losses, doing an excellent job bluffing its way to survival, because if it had become common knowledge and abundantly obvious how weak they were, they would have been swallowed up by the other clans immediately, right? In infighting in the clans start, started almost immediately after Tukiad, but the Inner Sphere had no idea about this whatsoever. Most of the clans were kind of fooled. The Inner Sphere absolutely bought it hook, line, and sinker. So the Inner Sphere sent a colossal fuck off invasion, like just a ludicrously large army into clan space to make an example of clan smoke jaguar. They invaded their home worlds and annihilated them. There was nothing left. They, I don't really want to use the G word, but yeah, the inner sphere basically genocided clan smoke jaguar and none of the other clans were willing use to the help G them. Word. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta use the G word. That's what happened. They obliterated them. They glassed their worlds, annihilated their industry, and basically laid all their planets to ash. There, there was basically nothing left of the Clan Smoke Jaguar. That's pretty much it. I don't think we have. Uh, I don't think we have anything else to talk about. That's Tukiad. And uh, to all the all of our supporters and subscribers and all the people watching, thank you. This the channel popped off way more than I thought, and you guys seem to enjoy uh, the wonderful dynamic me and Steve have going on. So thank you. You guys are the calm guard to my Frederick Steiner. Without you, I wouldn't be able to crush my opponents and drive them before me. Thank you very much. Hope y'all enjoyed. Catch y'all in next time. Ooh. Don't know what our release schedule is. So speaking speaking of next time, it's 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 gonna stay Wednesday. We're gonna keep uploading Wednesday. It seems to be working pretty well. Um, okay. Speaking of next time, we are, but at the drum roll, please, taking a break from Battletech. We are going to be talking about Battlestar Galactica next time. And I am so unbelievably hyped for this because while Battletech is the big, stompy, gritty, realistic, like ground warfare kind of sci fi, Battlestar Galactica is its long lost twin from the stars, man. I hope you have all had a wonderful day. Goodbye. We have to end this at some point, otherwise we're going to be going forever. See you next week for Battlestar Galactica, a lore primer.